Okay, so hello and welcome everybody. So this is section 16 of the notes. And what we'll do here is we will do some examples to illustrate what we did in the previous section. And in the previous section we discussed factors and interactions. And what I'll do here is I will just take some real data set and with this data set I will show you how we can use factors and interactions to get a better model for that data set. So let's have a look what we can do. Step one is to load the data into R. And the data set I'm going to consider here has the numbers in the file separated by spaces, not by commas. So we need read.table instead of read.csv. Here it is. And if we load that, we get something. Let's have a look at that. So what did we get? Well, first, we should store that in a variable. And we see immediately a problem here are added column headers v1 up to v5, but then the first row, if we look at it, actually is column headers. And what's going on here is read.table defaults to not having column headers. So what we need to do is we need to set header is true. And I said I want to store that in a variable, so let's try that. That looks better. Now the columns have proper names, and they are rows. I just showed the first six of them. And let's have a look. So mouse volume is numeric. Then we have H, which is numbers, which makes sense. Sex numbers seems to be one and zero. That will be encoded. And I happen to know zero stands for female and one stands for male. And then we have height and weight, which are both numbers. So that looks good with the possible exception of this column. And this data set does what it seems to do, namely of, I believe, 61 or so, yes, 61 volunteers. Somebody measured mouth volumes by pouring water into the mouth and seeing how much fits, and age, gender, height, and weight. And here we have a record of this, and my aim is to see whether mouth volume can be modeled as a function of the remaining variables. Good, so there's this. Then what about sex? So let's just make sure that is really one and zero. Yes, so you see 30 participants had a zero and 31 had a one. And we have a choice now. If we do it properly, we would encode this as a factor. So what we could do is say dd factor and then we do if else. Sex is zero, I said stands for female and one stands for male. So if we do that, then this command here turns zero and one into female and male, and factor tells R that it's a proper factor, and if I do it like this, then it overrides the current value of the sex column and replaces it with a proper factor. So now sex is marked as a factor with two levels, female and male, and you see here it's still numbers, that is how factors are done in R. So if I do head dd to print the start, then you see here we see male and female, but internally these are represented as numbers now, so that saves a bit of space and makes it a bit easier for R with the internal bookkeeping. And here are the internally used numbers, so most of the time they are hidden from view, but in the structure view that's one of the places where you can see them, and you could also do as numeric in the column, and there you see them too. And the point I'm trying to make here is, in general, what I just did is a good idea, and I will leave this in, but in this special case, it does not make a difference, because now if we think about fitting a model, so let's just do that. So at that mouse volume is the response, and then we take all others as input. If we do that, and then we do model matrix M, then you see that R use the factor coding we discussed in the previous section. And then there is are only two levels. It picks one as a reference level, and here it picked female. And then for the other levels, here's only one. There is for each remaining level a column. Here that is the column for male. And there is a one if sex equals male and a zero otherwise. So we get the column one, zero, 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 zero. And if you think back, that was exactly what we started with. So if we just read the data dd again, and so now I've just read it again, so I've undone all the changes I made, and you see 
it was encoded like this already. So for that specific data set, turning it into a factor makes no difference because after the factor coding, we get the same numbers are already had when it still sorts x was in numerical column. But let's do it properly here. In the notes, I just left it because it doesn't matter. Good, so we have already fitted a model. Let's have a look at that model. Summary M. So first thing you see, there are no markers in the end of the column except for a dot here. So that means none of the variables is significantly different from zero, where significantly means if we test for this one variable, it would reject the hypothesis that it equals zero. So that's bad. That's not a model we want, where well, not even the intercept R is sure whether that should contribute or not. But if you look down here, you will see the F test, which tests do the inputs affect the response at all. That comes out as a p-value of 0.001. So if we test at 5% level, we check is that smaller than 0.05. It's much smaller. So we reject the hypothesis that the inputs have no effect. So there is an effect but it doesn't show in these inputs. Okay, and what that could be is, it could be just collinearity. For example, height and weight will be strongly correlated and possibly age. So let's just do pairs cutter plot. Let's use the design matrix. I think that is the most relevant. So if I do X is model matrix M, and then I do pairs X and make it a bit larger then you see height and weight are not as clear-cut as I thought they may be, but still it looks a bit like a diagonal line. So that will be strongly correlated, I think. Let's just check. So correlation is 0.55. Not extreme, but it's noticeable correlation. Never mind. So what I want to do here is I want to talk about factors. I have done that a bit, but also about interactions. And the first thing I want to do is I want to include all interaction terms. So let's call that model M1, the one we just had. And then let's do M2 is the same thing, but with all pairwise interaction terms. So if I write second power here, that means take all original variables and all products of two of them. And that's the list of where I do that. And the dot just means all of them except for the response. So this way we get many more variables. Here you see, so we have still h, then factor coded sex, height, weight, but then we have h times sex, h times height, h times weight, sex times height, sex times weight, and height times weight. And you see, it didn't really work. So we have more variables, but we have still none of them literally now significant. And even worse now, because there are so many variables, there is more noise in the estimates. So even the F statistic isn't quite sure anymore. So it's still significant that the inputs have an effect on the outputs, but we mashed up things too much by adding too many inputs. We spoke about this, adding unnecessary inputs causes the variances of the estimates to increase, and then it's harder for them to be significantly different from zero. But now what I want to do is another thing we discussed, namely we can do model selection. That's a small example. We can use exhaustive search, 10 inputs plus the intercept. So there are 1024 models, two to the 10. If we had to try them manually, that would be hard work, but could be done, but we can just use the library leaps as before. And then we use rec subsets, I think. Let's remind ourselves. So X and data, and X is, I think, a formula, design matrix, or model formula. So let's do the same thing we just tried. And I don't think we need to do anything extra. So there is a method which could be exhaustive, backward, which means starts with full model and remove columns, forward, or something we haven't discussed, but exhaustive is the best if it's not too slow. And because it's listed first, it's the default. So if I do it like this, it does exhaustive search and it's only 1024 models, so that should work. It did something. I wonder why it's up to eight. Let me just try to understand that. Ah, NVMAX is eight. Good, let's set NVMAX to 10. Wonder whether that includes the intercept. Let's do it in 11 just to be sure. Ah, okay, 10 was the right answer because it changed my 11 to 10. Good, so we have that. Then we need to get the output. So let's store that somewhere. Let's call it R for rec subsets. 
and then summary r is where all the information is. So this now has the best subset of every size. So the best subset which has only one variable, you already see something slightly interesting happens, namely the best variable to use if you have only one of them is height times weight. If we do that and then the best variable, I can just copy it like this because colon in lm means just what we need here. It's the product of the two. And I type summary straight away. Good, I should have said earlier, rec subsets, if you don't tell it differently, always include the intercept. So that's what we have here. The intercept is there. It's now significantly different from zero and one coefficient, which is height times weight. So that would be one possible model. Then going back here, see with two coefficients, then funnily enough, we don't have that anymore, but we have sex times weight here, and the other one is here is age times weight. So weight seems to be important. And let's just try that. So that would be age times weight plus sex times weight. Now we have two coefficients, which are both uh, significant. And also the adjusted R squared improved from 0.21 to 0.23, which is good. So we have improved things further. So that goes on. So it seems not to matter so much which one you choose down here, because for three coefficients you drop both of the ones we had considered earlier, and now it's sex times height instead of sex times weight. And then h times weight stays, and sex is also included now separately. So that would mean the intercept would be different for both sexes. Good, but the question is, which one is best? And I suggest we just use adjusted r squared, because that is rather easy here. So let's store the summary object in s, and then s adjusted r squared gives the adjusted r squared values for all the models we had. So that 0.23 for two variables, that is this one. And here you see what's happening. So at two, that was quite good actually, much better than one. And the highest one clearly is this one, which is at five. You could ask which dot max, but we can also just look at it. So five variables and two variables are, I would say, the main contenders, because here three and four are worse than having two variables, so they will be more messy models, harder to interpret, and worse on R square value. And down here, again, it's more complicated models and it doesn't bias anything, things just get worse. So five variables is the clear winner, and then two variables is the runner up. So let's define seats. So M3, the two variable one, I can just copy. So let's just try that again. Summary M3, that's what we had, 0.23 was the correct adjusted R squared. And for five variables, we should be able to improve that to 0.246. We just need to read off which ones it is. And I think probably in this summary object S, dollar which, yes, is the matrix which has them all. And then we want row five, that's the ones. And which gives you the ones where there is a true. And because the vector has labels to its entries, we can still see them. So the intercept was the first one, then h, height, h, sex, and so on. So let's make this model m4 is lm, and then we just need to write them all. It's going to be five of them. So h, height, h times indicator function if the volunteer is female, and h times height, and male indicator times weight. So that's it, and then data is dd again. Let's try that, and summary m4. Why does this not work? I think I can here not just write sex m, I have to write sex, and then it will do the right thing automatically. That did not work again. You see, I have now an extra column here, which are invented for me because I couldn't write sex m here. I wonder why that is. Whatever the reason, I'm now paying for being too clever here. If you look in the notes, what you see in the notes is I did not actually do that in the notes. So let's just take that out. And if you have it like this, then all of these things still work. So now sex is just coded zero for female, one for male. And it's still one column with the same values actually. And the rec subset still works the same thing, only that sex is now this column with a different name. I still get my 0.23 here. And in this case, this approach works. 
So here we have now 0.246 as we are meant to have. So let's just leave it like this. I'm not entirely sure how to best do that if you have factors. I need to think about that a bit. But whatever, here we can just work around the problem by not doing this line because it's unnecessary. And let's just come back to this model. So that's the model with the best adjusted R squared. You see intercept and h are significantly different from zero and the interactions of h with height and sex with weight. And these would be significant as the dot at 10% level but are not at 5% level. So let's just do a quick residual plot. That looks not too bad, I would say. There are a few points a bit out, like the sample in the top left or in the bottom middle. And samples are more dense on the left, but that doesn't indicate a problem. That is just which data we are given. And very many data have apparently small y values, or at least which fits to small. And then the errors, I think, show no obvious pattern. So I think that's a reasonable model in my mind. And the only problem with that model is it's a bit messy because we have now our five inputs and three of them are interactions, so it will be not easy to interpret that in any way. M3 was our second best model. Let's have a look here. M3. That I would say also looks reasonable. Maybe that hangs a bit in the middle. I'm not quite sure. Let's put a line. Up line horizontal at zero. No, that looks right enough. So what I would do is I would choose this model just because it is nearly as good. And with these fewer terms here, we have a chance of actually making sense of this. So to conclude this, let's just have a quick go at interpreting this model. So what did we have? So we use the smaller model, the one I called M3 in R. So that has the intercept and the coefficient there I want to call beta zero. And then we had the interaction between age and weight. And we had the interaction between weight and sex. So beta one and beta two. And the estimated values, if I round them, I get 43.6781 for the intercept, 0 0.0056 for the interaction between age and weight, and 0 0.1274 for the interaction between sex and weight. So that's two interactions with weight. Good. And now the question is just, what does this mean? And it's not very difficult. So we know y is beta zero plus beta one. Let's just say xa is h and xw is weight. And xs is sex. And the first two are real numbers. And the third one is just zero or one. So we have beta 1 times h times weight, so xa times xw, plus beta 2 times weight times sex, so xw times xs, and then plus noise. So that's what we have straightforward, and there is nothing we can do about h times weight. That is just an input which came out well, but it increases in both of them. So larger h leads to larger mouse volume, and larger weight also correlates with larger mouse volume. That's what we see here. And here we can do something similar to what we did in the last lecture, namely sex is either zero or one. So if we just split this by gender, then beta zero plus beta one x a x w plus beta two times zero for females. And we have beta zero plus beta one x a x w plus beta two x w times one for males. And I don't know, but maybe a way to make sense of it a bit is to combine that here into beta 1 xa plus beta 2 times xw. And then we can compare that and that quantity. And you see beta 2 is positive, so that if you think of it as an interaction, then the weight dependence is, well, stronger for larger h. And if you think about it like this, so if you think about the right bracketed term as just the coefficient for weight, which happens on its own to depend on h, then you see that coefficient is larger 
for males than it is for females, because for males you get to add 0.1. And not quite clear how much this is. So we have this very small number, but that's multiplied with h. The median h in the data set I just checked is 25. So I checked in R for the data set. This quantity is strictly in the range from 0 0.105 up to 0.317. And half of them are in the range 0 0.122 up to 0 0.161. 1.27, so that here kind of doubles the coefficient for many cases. Well, I haven't checked for males and females separately, but that is the lower quartile, 0.122, and that is smaller than that thing. So for males, the coefficient will be about double, I would think. Good, and that is, I think, how far we get, and we should stop here with this example. So this was an example which showed a bit about how to use both factors and interactions in linear regression. And I want to stop this video here. And there will be another very short video where I talk a bit more about how to encode a factor as numerical input values in the design matrix. So see you very soon for that.